Wow, perfect. Wonderful. Well, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Melissa Stengel, founding partner and COO of Soltara Healing Center. And it's such an honor to host today's community Q&A with Dr. Gabor Mate. We are thrilled to have you all here for this special event and so grateful to Dr. Mate for taking time out of his busy schedule to spend some time with us today. Um, a quick note, I'm actually, oh, sorry. Yeah. Drop, it. Drop to Dr. Mate, would you? I'm sorry? Drop to Dr. Mate, just Gabor. Just Gabor. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so a quick note, I am actually in the Costa Rica jungle. So if I do have any internet issues, my assistant Julia will step in to support. Um, so for those who are new to Soltara, we are an ayahuasca retreat center based in Costa Rica. We work closely with indigenous Peruvian Shipibo healers and their deeply rooted wisdom tradition in combination with modern and holistic therapeutic support to provide a safe and integrative approach to healing. Our focus is on empowering individuals through ceremony, preparation, integration, and community, creating a safe and supportive space to explore body, mind, and spirit. I am so pleased to welcome you all, as well as Gabor, who serves on our advisory board alongside luminaries such as Dr. Dennis McKenna and Dr. Bia Labate, and likely needs no introduction, but I'll share a very brief one. Gabor is an internationally renowned speaker, best-selling author, and really a trailblazer in integrating modern science with ancient wisdom. With over four decades of clinical experience and groundbreaking work on trauma, addiction, mind-body health, he has really helped how reshape how we understand healing. His compassionate inquiry into the roots of our suffering has helped millions worldwide, as have his books, including The Myth of Normal and When the Body Says No. His insights into the therapeutic use of ayahuasca have also been really pivotal in advancing the conversation around plant medicine. So today we're privileged to explore Gabor's perspectives through your thoughtful questions. Thank you so much to everyone who submitted questions via our form. We've curated as many as possible and those we've selected have been notified in advance. So when I call your name, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question directly on camera. If you're not present or able to ask, we will move on to the next participant to keep things flowing. Um, a quick note that this event is being recorded and will be shared on our Nectara platform and YouTube. And if you'd like to learn more about Soltara, you can visit us at soltara.co or follow us on social media. So without further ado, let's begin. Gabor, thank you so much for being here. Is there anything you'd like to share before we dive into the Q&A? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And okay, so with that, I'd like to invite first to kick us off a dear friend of Soltara, as well as myself, former Aspen City Council member Skippy Mesrel, to start us off with his question. Oh, wow. Melissa, thank you so much. Um, thank you for having us here. And thank you for being a huge part of changing my life and Soltara and the whole family too. Like truly, um, I'm so grateful to be here. Gabor, um, what an honor, man. Uh, very brief anecdote. About eight years ago, I had a moment, just a moment where I realized that the difference between being the man, the human and leader I wanted to be was no longer external. It was internal. I had no idea what that meant, but I heard about this guy who wrote a book about ADHD and a book about addiction, two things that I knew well, and you were really the start of my journey. And I now host the Healing Our Politics podcast and help leaders across the country heal and up-level their communities by looking inward. And so the question I want to ask you is the question we finish every episode with, which is that the our listeners are what, you know, what Teddy Roosevelt would have called the humans in the arena. These are the small town mayors. They are the school superintendents. They're the people showing up at our election polls and in a very, very challenging environment, especially today. So if you were to leave them with just one thing, it could be a quote, a practice, a resource, an idea, a perspective that would best resource them to be a vector for healing our politics by doing that work first for themselves, what would that be? You don't start easy, do you? <laughs> Why would we? <laughs> Why would we? Um, <laughs> well, I'll tell you. There's a real problem in politics, which is that um, 
you can be truthful or you can be a politician, but it's hard to be both. Mm-hmm. When I say truthful, I mean truth to actually yourself. And there's a, a woman in politics that I respect. Mm-hmm. And uh, she actually, there was an election in British Columbia recently, a provincial election, and she lost. Mm-hmm. But I was talking to her a couple of years ago, but she's very principled. And I was talking to her and she said, the only way to say to stay authentic in politics is not to worry about being reelected. Mm-hmm. And um, she wasn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, you can't, if you're really idealistic and if you want to transform society in a healthy way, You really need to be true to yourself. If you're not, then any change that you're going to effect is going to be inauthentic. Mm-hmm. But the problem is that if you're authentic, in today's political world, it's very difficult to make it. Mm-hmm. So it's a question. The question becomes, what kind of energy do you want to put out into the world? Mm-hmm. You want to put out the energy of truth and authenticity and humanity and the heart Mm. or the energy of success and incremental manipulations of the system. Yeah. So I wish more politicians didn't care about being reelected, but they actually cared about speaking the truth of their heart, whatever their heart says. And I'm not, making um, partisan distinctions here. So that's what I would say, is really be true to yourself. And Amen. whatever, and, you know, and, and yeah, and th- that means, well, I've said enough. That's as much as I can say. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely makes sense to me. And I've walked that journey of both winning and losing by leading from the heart. And that's part of the game. Part of the game. That's right. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Felipe Nachar, are you here? Would you like to step in? Hi, Melissa. Nice to see you again. Hi, hi, Nice to meet you virtually. Um, I was reading your latest book, The Myth of Normal, um, and I was struck by... The first paradox you highlight, meaning, you know, despite access to lots of, you know, knowledge and access to wellness and healing tools, um, we seem unable to fully benefit from them. At least that's what I see from a community perspective, society perspective. Um, Do you think this is primarily an issue of limited access or some communities or cultures or, or countries? Um, and if so, if it's just a premier, you know, just an issue of limited access, how can we address it? Um, if not, what do you attribute it to this disconnect between access to wellness tools and our inability to fully benefit from them? Philippe, do you mean in terms of overall health? Is that what you mean? Yeah, from biological yeah. to psychological healing. So- so, so the paradox that you're setting up is, which I talk about in the myth of normal, is on the one hand, our incredible medical technologies and scientific advances and insights and capacities and techniques on the one hand, on the other hand, the worsening health of the population. Well, here's the problem. And the analogy is totally apt. Think of a, a, a boat on the ocean with a huge hole in the bottom and the water keeps pouring in. And then you have somebody with a teaspoon ladling the water out so that the issue is not one of access. The issue is that the toxicity of this culture makes people sick. I just read an article in the New York Times yesterday, 70, 80% now, 79% of Americans are either overweight or obese which sets them up for high blood pressure, for cardiac disease, for diabetes, for cancer, uh, joint diseases, and so on. Now, why is there such an epidemic? 
worldwide, but particularly in the States. It's not because lack of access to medical care. It's because people are stressed and they, they, they eat junk food to soothe their stresses. It's because the food companies um, deliberately concoct products that make people addicted to salt, sugar, and fat. It's because people are so harassed and harried that they go for fast foods without regard of what those foods actually contain. It's because people are not educated about healthy ways of eating. Now, it's because if you walked on the supermarket aisles, you see one sugar-laden product after another that has been given to kids. It's because of poverty where healthy food becomes forbiddingly expensive. So, and this, and I'm only talking about one little aspect, one aspect of the society, the toxicity of the society. So, what I'm saying is that the reason for the 70% of American adults are at least on one medication, 70%, 40% are at least on two medications. It's the sickest society in the history of the world. It's also the richest society in the history of the world with the most medical resources. So the problem is not one of health care. I mean, there's all kinds of problems with health care. But the problem isn't with health care as such only. It's also with the way of life that people pursue when they're alienated from themselves, which in this culture they are. So it's a much broader issue than just health care. Then we could, I could talk for hours about what's wrong with the healthcare system. But even if we had a perfect healthcare system, if people are living lives that toxify them, we would still have the same problems. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Tiffany Monsonari. We've got a couple questions from you, I think. Hi, Gabor. Um, I probably sound like a broken record, but really, truly, thank you so much for what you do um, and the work that you put out. Um, I'm personally interested, you know, um, in how your work and your own healing journey um, specifically intersects with ayahuasca. Yeah. And so you know, we were just talking about the healthcare system broadly. So I'm curious, you know, in your ideal vision of a healthcare, health building system, where would something like ayahuasca factor in? Yeah. So I first found out about ayahuasca after I wrote my book on addiction in the realm of hungry ghosts. And as I was traveling on a book tour with that work, every once in a while, somebody would put their hand up and ask me, what do you know about ayahuasca and the healing of addiction? And I'd say, I know nothing. Yeah, because what did I know? Nothing. I mean, nothing about psychedelics in general. Then at the next talk, what do you know about, you know, nothing. What do you, next talk? I finally got sick of the question because I, I thought, you know, well, for God's sakes, I've just spent three years pouring my life's work into this book and you ask me about the one thing I don't know anything about, you know? Finally, somebody said, you know, you could experience this uh, plant even here in Vancouver, where you live in British Columbia, because there was a Peruvian shaman who was coming up here to lead a retreat, a ceremony. And I participated in the ceremony, and within half an hour, I got it, because I experienced a deep heart opening that made me realize why people were asking me about addictions, because... When people are hurt early in life, as I was, you close the heart down to protect yourself. But that closing of the heart then creates all kinds of problems. And with the ayahuasca, <clears throat> I could see within a couple of days that one could both open the heart and also feel the pain that you've been running away from. But with the heart open, you don't have to keep running. So that's in a quick nutshell, 
um, what I experienced and saw. So then I began to work with the plant. Um, <clears throat> typically for me, rather than what I should have done, was to deepen my personal work with the plant for my own healing. I'd always thought, okay, how can I use this to heal others? And I could, I could, I got quite good at it, Le leading re retreats and bringing people together for a week and ceremonies and processing and integrating and preparing and so on. And so since then, I've seen that the plant, along with other psychedelics, but my work has mostly been with ayahuasca, um, can promote healing of mind and body, which can promote the healing not only of addictions, but also of depression and anxiety, autoimmune disease, and um, other conditions. So as to your question as to how that would fit in with, um, and you know, and, and my arrangement with Soltara is that um, because I'm on the board of advisors, I do have the privilege of offering scholarships to a number of people every year to go to Soltara. And I've worked with other, Soltara is not the only ayahuasca center I've worked with. Um, so I've seen what, what the plan can do. So how would this fit into a healthcare system? Well, ideally, <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> completely irrational illegality of the plant in North America would be ended. I mean, it's just irrational. I mean, it's just, it's not that there are no potential hazards like with any modality of healing, the potential hazards, which don't come from the plant as such, they come from how it's used and who leads the ceremonies and how much integrity and how much experience they've had. But ideally, um, these plant medicines would be available for people in an affordable way, because that's the other issue. It's not cheap to go to Solterra. And even in North America, if you find a good provider, which is always underground, you're gonna to have to be a fair bit of money to participate even in one ceremony, let alone a series of ceremonies. So there's all kinds of potential problems, but ideally knowing that these plants can offer benefits that Western medicine can't even conceive of, they'd be integrated into a, an open healthcare system where people would be made aware of these potentials of these plants, particularly ayahuasca, where authentic ayahuasca could lead ceremonies for people, where people trained in therapy and people trained in knowing how to prepare people for ceremony and how to help them integrate what they've learned into their lives. These would be incorporated into a much more open and broader healthcare system than we have right now, ideally. Again, there'd be all kinds of practical problems with availability of properly trained ayahuasca let alone the question of appropriating cultural appropriation, which is another issue. So it has to be done with respect for the origins and the originators of these modalities. There's the question of cost and all kinds of problems. But these could be worked out given some goodwill and given some expertise. So I'd see I'd like to see them integrated to the degree that's possible. Thank you so much. And as just a quick follow to that, you know, you talked a lot about heart opening. Um, and you know, I've heard you speak about your ayahuasca experiences in other places, but um, I'd love to know more specifically because the ayahuasca purge is something that a lot of people are afraid of before going yeah. into ceremony. And I'd love to know from you personally, what does the purge mean to you? And how does that factor into the healing that you can find? Well, you know, uh... <laughs> If you, um, people confuse 
the purge with being, you know, like when you say I got sick to my stomach, people talk about throwing up. So people confuse the purge, the purge with getting sick. But it's the opposite. If you read Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, the first uh, book is about inferno hell. The second book is about purgatory, where people are purged of their sins. And if you look at the Aramaic or, or Greek meaning of the word sin, it's not some terrible thing you did. It's a mistake you made. It's a misunderstanding you had. It's where you missed the mark. And when we purge, it's not that we're being sick. It's that we're getting material, getting rid of material or, or expelling material that doesn't belong to us. That somehow toxified us. So I myself, when I take part in ayahuasca ceremony, not that I like sitting there with that queasiness in my belly. I really don't like it. But boy, do I feel great after I purge. There's just the whole body ease and relaxation and sense of wellness. Not a sense of wellness, a wellness. So people should not confuse purging with being sick. It's just the very opposite. Thank you so much, Kapoor. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Chelsea Chisholm Vargas, I'm going to ask you a question. Yes. Hi, y'all. Hi, Brother Gabor. It's nice to meet you here. Uh, my name is Chelsea. And I should say, too, before I um, just straight up ask my question, I am a community organizer, community health worker here in Chicago. Um, I operate a food pantry on the south side. So a lot of my work is really um, has always been in just direct service. Um, so my question is, as many of us who are in the midst of focusing deeply on healing our individual trauma, connecting to our most inner self and protecting our energy, particularly through psychedelics like ayahuasca, how and when do we intentionally transition into connecting with the collective trauma of a world in the midst of intense global suffering? And what steps help us in turning our individual healing into a gift for shared healing? Yeah, that's a difficult one. And it's difficult because when people come to ceremony, they have recognized that there's something to work on, some healing that needs to happen. But you can't force anybody to come into ceremony. You can't force anybody to seek healing. And it is a very sick world if we look at it today even without going to the specific politics, uh, even without going into, I mean, I could talk about the suffering that's taking place. As we know, children are being killed, mutilated. People are being threatened with deportation. Families are being threatened with being broken up. Poverty is effect affecting so many people. But you can't heal people, you can't force people into healing until they recognize that there's some healing needed. So healing is nothing we can impose on anybody else. So, where does that leave us? First of all, it leaves us having to decide each of us for ourselves what kind of energy they want to bring into the into the world a healing energy or a selfish energy which is the opposite of healing um an energy that reflects some faith in human beings or despair How do we approach people that we don't agree with or that don't agree with us? These are all really energetic questions that we have to work out within ourselves. So what do we bring to this question that you're raising? <sighs> I 
And then can we join with others who share the same intention and the same energy? In other words, do we just um, um, labor on by ourselves as individuals? Or can we come together in communities with like-minded people? And then it's a question of location and possibility. Like, what can you do? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to ask you personally, but I imagine the recent election in the United States would have generated a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. A lot of fear, perhaps. For other people, the election was a vindication and a victory. I don't know how to bring those two sides together. I have no idea. All I can say is, how can we show up in this world as individuals and as communities and as groups trying to bring as much healing energy and hoping that that energy will then attract others. Beyond that, your question is a social one and a political one. And I'm not going to put myself into a position of advising people on that. Because my politics is not the same as other people's politics. And unfortunately, in this world today, people are living in bubbles. But there's barely even communication. People in one group and another. Um, that's about all I can say and it's a very unsatisfactory answer and I'm fully aware of the unsatisfactoriness of what I just said but in a short conversation that's about all I can tell you I don't know if that made any sense to you or not but I found myself babbling a little bit trying to look for some proper answer here but does any of that make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, it. Um, it's kind of where I'm at with it, too. Like, I'm just kind of feel like kind of obviously within myself, but um, continuing to search for um, communities that want to get down in this similar way of, um, you know, not polarizing anybody. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a hard balance of like wanting to make sure you don't get burnt out um, while healing your own self and continuing to be of service to um a larger good so yeah well that last thing you said is really important because um if you don't take care of yourself you will get burned out mm -hmm. and the, here's the reality you and i and everybody else in this call could work 24 7 7 days a week 365 days a year and will only be a drop in the bucket of what's required mm -hmm. And and I don't mean that as a pejorative. I just mean that's the nature of the world. So if we burn out, if we take it all on, and we have to do it all, we have to do it all right now, and it's all on us, you're going to get burnt out. Mm -hmm. So self-care is really important. Yeah. Yeah, I even found myself during my own ceremonies, like I'm um, struggling with like, you know, I'm, I'm here focusing so deeply on myself and what does that mean to be doing that um, with all the suffering that's going on? I, I dealt with selfishness around that too. Um, well, let me ask you, let me ask, sorry, Intra, let me ask you a question. When you do that work on yourself in ceremony, does that enhance or inhibit your capacity to help others? Definitely enhance. So that's not a question of selfishness. Yeah. There's no selfishness there. Mm -hmm. There's no contradiction there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so beautiful. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Uh, Miranda Sousa, are you in the room? I'm here. Hello, everyone. Hi, Gabor. Hi. Just want to say how incredibly grateful I am for you and the work that you do. My question for you today is what practices or mindsets do you find most helpful for individuals who've made significant progress in their healing journey, but still feel trapped by residual pain from childhood trauma? 
Well, you're talking about all of us, including myself. Uh, but are you make? Can I ask you? Is this a personal question? Absolutely. So, can I ask you a question? Yes. If you look at Miranda, say ten years ago, and Miranda today. And if you compare the two Mirandas in terms of liberation from the constraints of childhood pain, which Miranda would you rather be 10 years ago or today? Today. Right. In other words, it's an ongoing process. And your word trapped may not be appropriate. You're not trapped at all. You just haven't gone as far as you want to go yet. But, but... Trap means you're stuck in the same place. When you're trapped, you can't move. An animal caught in a trap can't move. They can't leave. They can't go somewhere else. You have not been trapped. Over 10 years, you've moved along. Have you not? So why do you talk about yourself as being trapped? If you're saying, no, I'm not making you wrong for it. I'm actually asking a question. And I'll give you the answer right away. Because to the child self, it feels like I'm trapped. So that when those painful feelings and, and those coping mechanisms dictated by childhood pain arise, you think you're back in the same place. That's the child mind. Because for the child's mind, the present moment is eternity. But if you actually look at it more objectively, you're moving along. So trapped, you're not. But I got to tell you, it's a lifelong process. So I, as I've often said, you know, I, I mean, in a couple of months, <laughs> I'll be 81 years old, okay? And honest to God, when I'm 81, I'll be able to look back and say to myself, thank God. I'm not as young and stupid as I was when I was 80, you know? So it's not a question of being trapped. It's a question of revisiting old places, and then you move on. I hope that answer makes sense to you. It does. It, Thank you. And by the way, next Tuesday morning, I have an appointment with a therapist because there's some things... I've had to learn recently. I haven't figured out yet. I haven't healed from yet. So it's an ongoing process. So when you do feel, have this perception of being trapped, you reach out for help. I do. You know, that's what I got to say. Thank you so much. Um, so in the interest of time, um, I'm going to invite Christopher Coakley, and I know that you submitted two great questions. If you could just pick one, um, we'd love to have you. Sure. Thank you. Um, hi, Gabor. Hi. Um, it's Christopher. Um, I'm almost to the end of Myth of Normal. Amazing book. It's a Thank lot, um, but it's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> um, my question is if you have any advice on how to become more aware in the moment of the difference between experiencing and expressing um, healthy, albeit challenging emotions, versus expressing or acting out of unhealthy triggered trauma response. Because when I'm in the throes of it, I can't tell often until the damage is done. And there, afterwards, there is a wonderful reflection. I can feel that I grow from it and it sort of lessens over time but in the moment I struggled to yeah. tell the difference well I mean you've given part of the answer already which is first of all it's going to happen that you're going to react from an old painful place and then you say what the heck was that about but at least then you reflect on what happened so that's a good beginning because a lot of people just react and never reflect so they, they think that the problem is with somebody else or some external situation, and they never come to the point of self-reflection. 
And if you're one of these people that you never come to the point of self-reflection, you can be president of the United States. <laughs> or any, of any party, by the way. Because it was, when you look at <laughs> um, people in politics, what they never do is reflect. They even talk about not reflecting. It's very interesting. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump both said the same thing about self-reflection. We don't do that because we don't want to find out what, what may emerge. They both said that almost in literally the same words. So self-reflection is really important. So that's not a negligible thing that you're doing if you reflect afterwards. Because the more you do, the less likely you are to react again the next time. So that constant and, and frequent self-reflection and I have an exercise for that that I won't go through it with you now, but it's really important. Now, the other thing is, I'm going to ask you a question. When you react out of an old pain and, and out of an old wound, what do you feel inside yourself just before you do? If you could, if you could imagine you being in that state now, can you imagine that right now? Okay, what do you feel inside yourself when you're in that reactive state? <clears throat> Terror. Terror? Okay. And that's already, um, I'll take that, but that's already um, a descriptive word. I'm asking you, what do you experience in your body? Mm. Um, like, a, a, a chasm in my chest um a void and it's painful okay that's a very powerful signal what do you experience when you are able to respond from a present moment requirement or need what do you experience then um i feel very solid chasm, pain on the one hand, solid on the other. Your body's telling you the difference. Mm -hmm. So what you need to develop here is more body awareness. Mm -hmm. And whenever you feel that pain and chasm, you say to yourself, I'm experiencing pain and chasm right now. Mm -hmm. I need a time out. I need a moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we all get caught in reactivity. I do, you know. But the more body awareness we can bring to the moment. So that's just the practice of, of, of learning some body awareness here. And then don't try and figure out in your head. Your body will tell you the answer. The body is telling you the answer as it just did. Mm -hmm. right. Fair enough? Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Um, so I think we have time for just one more question. Um, so I'm so sorry, we might not get to everyone. Um, Zifeng Wei, are you in the room? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, just a little bit of a personal anecdote. So um, I was born in China and uh, moved with my parents to Budapest uh, when I was two years old. But they were yeah. too busy, so so uh, they sent me uh, Bessie, like uh, mm -hmm. So they sent me back to um, uh, China with a stranger to live with a grandmother that I've never met, mm -hmm. uh, and so I can relate to your story uh, a lot. Of course, it's not as uh, uh, as stressful from the mother's side, uh, but as a baby, uh, I assume it's quite uh, stressful as well. And then. Um, and then returned to my parents when I was five years old. And um, now I'm uh, an entrepreneur and quite driven. And uh, and the question is, you know, it often seems like um, those who have suffered these kind of a childhood trauma of you or, you know, David Goggins or other uh, successful entre entrepreneurs or athletes, they, they have this certain drive that allows them to succeed in life you know this uh, addictive hard work you know in in sports or financially or in business yeah. and then 
I guess what's the, the question is how, how do we contend with this uh, dichotomy? You know, uh, can we treat it um, uh, with trauma or or, or channel uh, or treat it as like a positive force or, or channel it in, in a positive way? Sure. Yeah, I guess that's sure. That's a really important question. Um, let me ask you a question first. I mean, I hear what I hear you suggesting, and I think it's absolutely true that that early trauma can give you a kind of drive that helps you succeed in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and maybe so, that's the reason uh, maybe you think you, you think are successful. It may be contributing to it for sure. But here's my question to you: What price do you pay for that? Yeah. What's the price? Yeah, you uh, neglect your your family and yeah your your loved ones. And uh, I'm beginning to, and after reading your book, you know, and uh, I'm beginning to see that and, and trying to change and and it's improved a lot, you know, uh, with the uh, family. But it's still difficult to have this. Oh, I understand. So there are two questions here. One is a theoretical one was, is that trauma necessary for success? Yeah. That's one question, but that's purely theoretical. Then there's a practical question. What is it costing you now? And do you want to continue that way? Mm. Second question you can deal with. The first question is a theoretical one. Now, here's my answer. You talked about being driven, right? The drive, yeah. the drive. Now, how much freedom is there in being driven? When a leaf is driven by the wind, how much freedom does that leaf have? Mm. To choose its own direction and momentum and velocity. Does that leaf have any freedom at all? Mm. Nice question at least no, no. none yeah not much not yeah do you want to be that leaf or do you want freedom mm -hmm. now that's the first question the second question is the entrepreneurship and the work that you do it's creative work isn't it At the moment, no, I guess uh, not a little bit, but uh, not as much as electronics that. manufacturing. Okay. okay, not as much as I would like to be. Yeah, and all right. In a way, I'm being okay. driven, as you're saying, by this wind. I guess. Okay, then you have. Let me ask you another question. Then, is there something else that's calling you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, now here's the difference of being driven and being called. If I call you up on the phone, you have the option of answering or not answering. If mm -hmm. I phone you up and say, Zhang Wai, will you have coffee with me? You can say, yes, Gabor, I'll have coffee with you. Or no, Gabor, I'm too busy to have coffee with you. I don't feel like it. There's freedom in being called because you get to decide whether you want to answer the call or not. But if you're being driven, there's no freedom in it. Mm. So the question is, do we want to be called or do we want to be driven? And that's only a decision. Only you can make that decision. And if you choose being called, you may have success in the world or you may not. There's no guarantees. The question is, do you want to be free or do you not? And that's only, nobody can answer that question for you. But I can tell you in principle that the people that choose freedom, they may or may not experience the success in the world that they 
valued so highly, but they experience a different kind of success. And I've often mentioned a book um, <clears throat> that kind of reflects my own findings, but this is, book was written by a palliative care nurse in Africa, in, in Australia. And I used to work in palliative care, looking after terminally ill people. And this nurse working with palliative care people found, she wrote a book called The Top Five Regrets of Dying People. You know what the top regret was? That I wasn't myself. These are people that die before their time of cancer. Another regret was I worked too hard. I neglected my friends. Another regret was I didn't experience, uh, express my emotions. And I didn't allow myself to be happy, to play enough. I worked too hard. Now the question is, do you want to be on your deathbed having those regrets? Or would you rather decide now in favor of freedom? Nobody can tell you what to do. Mm. Now, as to your question, is that drive necessary for success? Maybe in this world, in this toxic world, there's some truth to that. But at what cost? And all these driven people, look at the damage they're doing in the world. Look what they're doing to the world. And look what I've done to the world and to my family when I was driven. So I'm really glad you're asking the question. And I hope you'll engage with it very deeply. Okay? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful answer, beautiful questions. Thank you, Gabor, for sharing your wisdom with us today and for offering such insightful perspectives on these important questions. Your work continues to inspire and transform the lives of so many. And we're just so deeply grateful for the time and care you've offered to our community and to have you on our advisory board. Thank you. So to I everyone who joined us. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I just want to mention one thing. I did see a question. Where do I find a therapist? Now, um, Soltara um, has partly been informed by compassionate inquiry, which is a therapeutic modality that I've helped to develop. And I've trained. Uh, it's, a year, it's, it's a very deep training in a, in a mode of therapy. It's not the only mode of therapy. I'm not claiming it's the best either, but it's the one that I've developed. If people are interested in, in therapy, or if those of you are therapists, you could actually consider taking that training. You can look up Compassionate Inquiry online. Those of you that are looking for therapists, it's one modality of therapy you can look up, and you can look for Compassionate Inquiry practitioners online. And now they exist all over the world. And I know that to some degree, Soltero employs it in your own in your, in your own processing of people. So. It's called Compassion Inquiry. You can check it out online. I just wanted to mention that. Uh, thank you so, so much. And uh, we will send an email, a follow-up email and sharing our Soltara network where we do have practitioners who have trained in Gabor's uh, Compassionate Inquiry. So if you're looking for someone, they do sessions globally all over the world as well. Um, so to everyone who joined us, thank you so much for being here and for your thoughtful questions. It's really your engagement and curiosity that make events like these so meaningful. And if we couldn't get to your question today, please know how much we value your participation and we'll aim to address more of these topics in future sessions. So before we wrap up, I'd love to invite you to connect with the Soltara community through our virtual platform hosted in collaboration with Nectara. It's an incredible community space where we have monthly virtual events and gatherings, workshops, resources, courses, spaces for connection, and as well as I mentioned, this carefully vetted network of practitioners. Um, we offer a free membership, and then for those looking for full access, we have a PLUS membership. If you've attended a retreat with us, this PLUS membership is included for a full year as part of your experience. Um, so we'll share more details and a link to sign up in our follow-up email. And we'll also share the recording of this. So please stay connected with us on soltara.co and our social media for updates and future events. And Gabor, is there anything else you'd like to share before we close? No, I'm just, just my gratitude to, to be able to be connect with um, this work and with communities such as yours that are dedicated to the work. It really has enhanced my own life and uh, 
deeper in my own understanding of life. So thank you. Thank you. We're so equally grateful. Thank you so much, everyone. And we look forward to connecting with you at future events. Have a wonderful Thank day. Thank you. This was wonderful. <laughs> Bye. Kapoor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lovely. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Take Thank care. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was awesome. Thank you very much. Amazing, yeah. man. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all.